Hello, everybody. Welcome to the first of the Saturday sessions presented by the LA3D Club. I'm David Kuntz. I'm the workshop director for the LA3D Club. Now, the idea for these Saturday sessions was actually created by today's presenter, Carl Wilson, and the idea was to give away, uh, have a way to give people some in-depth instruction for various techniques in processing 3D photos. So today, Carl's going to cover some basic workflow for taking a 3D photo from exposure through final presentation. And in the future, we hope to have other workshops on topics like high dynamic range photography, compositing, 3D conversions, and so forth. So Carl, who is conducting today's workshop, um, has been shooting 3D since 2005. And he's joined our LA 3D Club in 2012, and he quickly rose to the top of the ladder in our competitions, although often one rung below me. Um, he's also <laughs> won several awards from the NSA and in PSA competitions. So I'm going to turn it over to Carl now. So Carl, I'm going to unspotlight myself. I'm going to spotlight you. You're going to share your screen. And if all goes well, uh, we'll actually get this thing on the road. So hold on. how the heck, why am I not seeing? There we go. So I will. I see. I see my big face on the screen. So beautiful. I don't even know. How, did somebody sees. already do that. Yeah, somebody already did it while I wasn't watching. So um, yes, our our uh, and I would like to thank uh, Valerie and Steve who are silently working in the background to actually make this thing work. And so far, apparently doing a very good job. All right, take it away. Okay. So uh, the the ideas for these. Uh, sessions came from someone asking me recently if I divulge my secrets, um, which I, I found rather amusing because uh, I, I've always shared anything with anybody if they, if they want to know. Um, but it got me thinking about the workshops that we have in general, and they tend to sort of be very, you know, they're, they're due to time constraints, you can't really get into the nitty gritty necessarily of, of how things work. And I thought it would be interesting to uh, you know, take people through the entire process um, from beginning to end. Um, uh, in a year, uh, you know, I don't know how many 3D photos you guys take, but I don't know, thousand, you know, I, I just would be a, a rough estimate of probably how many I take in a year. And out of those thousand photos, I might publish online, you know, through Flickr and Instagram and other platforms, maybe a hundred, not a lot. So I, I find that you know, for the for the photos that I, I do publish that um, I want them to be as, as best as they can be. And so to me, it's worth the effort, the time and effort to take a, an already interesting photo that's in 3D and, and make it better. Typically, I, I've, uh, the, the most of the photos that I present are either nature or still life or architecture. Um, but today we're going to use a photo that has a person in it. Um, and the reason that we're going to do that is because it's, it's going to cover, you know, all sorts of different photo techniques that I'll, I'll use uh, 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 when I'm processing a photo. Um, typically on my desk, um, I, keep, uh, I keep one of these, which is a, a parallel viewer. Uh, you can get these through, uh, I know Steve Bears and sells them through his website. Um, and this is uh, very handy to have. Um, another thing that I have is... Uh, passive 3D glasses and that's because I, I have a passive 3D monitor that's just to the just to this side of the monitor I'm working on right now um, for, for viewing my 3D photos. Um, but that's about it. Uh, I'm, I'm assuming everybody here or hoping everybody here has Photoshop. If you don't, um, there are certainly other online photo editing uh, programs like I, I think there's one called Pixlr. Um, there's, uh, I, I just, you know, there's other programs and I'm assuming that maybe some of these other programs allow you to do some of the stuff we're going to do today. So let me go ahead and share my screen. And um, so the, the, uh, the person in this photo is my wife. Uh, she took up ukulele playing here during COVID and uh, wanted to start a YouTube channel, wanted some pictures with her and her ukulele. So we were out driving a couple of weekends ago. Oh, and I'll go ahead and show you here really quick. This is my, this is my typical rig, which I've been using for the last several years. This is uh, two Canon G12s that, are, uh, that use uh, a stereo data maker. 
Um, for this photo, I did not use this rig though because I was out on a photo trip a couple of weeks ago and I accidentally dropped my sink cable into a river. <laughs> so I'm waiting for a, a couple of new sink cables to come for this. Uh, in the meantime, I was sort of having a, an existential crisis. So I decided that I would dust off my old, very old um, Sony rig, the old Sony DSCV threes with the external flash and the and the uh, Lang Shepard Pro. I uh, put all my batteries and in, in chargers and got it all going, and I'll be damned if the thing worked. So uh, I was happy to have this because it's also got this fantastic fill flash. So anyway, uh, we ran out, and let me go back to sharing my screen here. Just driving along and I, I'm always, when I'm driving around or, or looking at my environment, I'm always trying to frame my world in 3D. I've, I've always got sort of this, you know, I've, I've got this viewfinder approach to my life ever since I started shooting in 3D and I'm always looking for, for an interesting area. And you know, we were just driving along the road on the ridge of a mountain here. I live down in the Ozarks and um, saw this great tree with the red flowers behind it. And we had nice clouds in the sky and just seemed like a perfect place to pull over on the side of the road and take some pictures. Um, the sun was setting, and so I ended up with some pretty harsh shadows. And I think I took about 10 photos or so, but um, all, all I did is I, is I ran through them here. As you can see, th this is typical of the old Sony DSCV3 setup. I, my, my flash missynced, so that's, a, that's no good. <laughs> But uh, I ran through them and I think I ended up settling on not this one. But I ended up settling on this photo right here. So uh, I, I don't want to get into a full tutorial of, uh, of a stereo photo maker. Um, but you know, you just hit Alt A and you, uh, it, it corrects for, it's going to correct for any uh, rotational issues or misalignment issues. It's going to line them up. I'm going to use my left and my right arrows, and I'm going to, I'm going to window the photo. And uh, at this point, we're ready to edit. Um, just as a side note, I mean, sometimes I will save the photo as a left and a right, as, as separate images, but in this case, I'm going to edit them as a side-by-side -side photo. So let's go ahead and open up the photo. And here we go. This will be interesting for me because I've never walked people through my entire process. So uh, here we go. Uh, I'm looking at this thing and, and the first thing I do when I look at a photo is I go, what irritates me and what can be better? Um, the first thing that irritates me about this photo is, is the shadows on her face. Um, uh, another thing that irritates me about this photo is, is that the sky is a little bit washed out. And another thing that irritates me is um, I, I feel like I could get more color and detail out of it. I, I tend not to use filters um, that affect an entire photo. Uh, it, it, like someone had mentioned to me that the, why don't you use shadows and the highlights, shadow and highlights filter in Photoshop on this. Uh, my response is because it affects the entire photo. Um, and I don't want to affect the entire photo. I just I, I want to selectively edit. So in this case, the first thing that I want to work on are these shadows on her face. One of my favorite tools is, I'm going to have to move my camera just a little bit. One of my favorite tools is Quick Mask. Um, which, uh, and there's a, there's a little control button for it. And by the way, I'm using, um, I'm using Photoshop CS6 here, just so you know. But I'll go into a quick mask mode. Oh, and before I do that, just as a side note, I'm always duplicating my layers. Um, I like to hold on to the original photo at the bottom um, because if anything, if I screw anything up, I can borrow from it. Um, my photo editing method has been called destructive um, and it, sort of is, um, but I find that I tend to be very decisive when I'm, when I'm uh, editing a photo. So uh, being destructive is not necessarily um, 
uh, a bad thing in my view. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to start working on these shadows. So um, on my copied layer, I'm going to go ahead and enter the quick mask mode. And I'm going to select a brush. And as you can see, this brush is very small, so we're going to make it larger. That's maybe a little bit too large. About, the, oops. My bad. I seem to not be in quick mask mode. Now I am. All right. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to select the areas here that I want. to brighten up the shadows. And I'm going to get her other side of her face here in just a second. Carl, um, yes, I sir? think whenever you go to do any command or tool, it's useful to do an exaggeratedly slow and highly narrated thing that says, I am now going over here to pick up this tool and kind of hesitate over it so that people okay. can see. Because otherwise, it's like, hold on, where the hell did he get that tool? All right. Well, we are going to record this. Set. We are recording this session. I, I'm not sure when we're going to post it, but um, you know, I'm saying uh, it's, it's always good to ho hover over the tool for a second and say, sure. "I'm now going over to the brush tool." And you yeah, know, okay, because people may it. not know where some of this stuff is. I, I will. I will do my best. David is right in that uh, we tend to uh, gloss over the things that uh, uh, that we do that. Um, are familiar to us and maybe not familiar to others. So I've, I've selected the areas that I want to that I want to brighten up these shadows. And all I'm going to do is I'm going to pull back here just a little bit and kind of make sure that I'm that these that these are matched. You know that I'm grabbing the same areas. I, I certainly when this is all said and done, I don't want uh, retinal rivalries. Um, at this point, we're going to exit quick mask mode, and that's just coming back down to the to the quick mask mode button down here. And if I hit it. It now exits the quick, quick mask mode. And as you'll see, it, it doesn't select the area that uh, I painted. It selects the rest of the photo. It's, and so to, to grab this area, and just so you know, and when I selected my, my brush for this, I was using a soft edge brush. And um, that just makes everything blend a little bit better. So what I'm going to do, though, since the entire photo is selected other than this area, is I'm going to go to Select Inverse. And now what is selected is just these areas that I highlighted. And at this point, what is good for one side of the photo will be good for the other, as long as my exposures match. And in this case, they do. So I'm going to go to image adjustments and levels. And in my levels here, I can sort of control the lightness and the darkness of the photo. And in the center slider here is my lightness. And I'm going to just slide it up. I'm going to brighten up her face. You guys are going to hate me for this, but I'm going to go ahead and stop here for just, I'm, I'm going to get it to where I want it. Which to me, the, this is fine, but uh, there, there is one thing that I skipped here, and, uh, and that is, is her, the other side of her face is overexposed. As you can see, this is sort of blown out. So I'm going to make another duplicate layer. And this is sort of the, the perfect place for it. And on this duplicate layer, I'm just going to drop the, I'm going to drop the exposure for the entire photo. Because I, I want, I, I don't like having blown out areas in a photo. And right there. At point three three, that that looks right to me. That looks right. So I, I'm going to go ahead and just merge this with my background photo. And unfortunately, I'm, I'm going to have to go back and, and do this other layer again. 
uh, and this is this is where the the, the destructive uh, the destructive side of me uh, comes into play. So again, back into quick mask mode. Again, I'm selecting my brush. I'm going to use this soft brush. And we can go ahead and select these areas again. One thing to consider too is, is ultimately how you're going to be publishing your photo. If you're making a stereo card or if you're making a, um, or if you're just going to be publishing on Instagram or, or Facebook or someplace where your photo is going to be displayed in a rather small manner. Um, super pinpoint accuracy is not necessarily going to be needed. Um, however, if you're, if you're going to plan it on presenting it blown up on a big screen, uh, you want, might want to be a little bit more careful and a little bit more precise in your editing. And, and in this process, I already know that at most this is going to end up as a, as a stereo card, maybe. Um, I, I did put this on Instagram, I believe, but the, the, presentation of the photo is so small that um, that it doesn't need to really be super accurate. And you'll, you'll start to learn these things as you as you play with photos. So again, I'm going to exit my quick mask mode. I'm going to select the inverse. We're going to get rid of those shadows best we can. I'm going to add a little bit here. Going back to those levels. step back, I look at the entire photo in its entirety and I go, okay, I, I, I like the direction this is going. Um, her face is now visible and, and the, the shadows aren't too harsh. Um, one, one more thing I'm going to cover here real quick is, uh, is I, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to do just a, a couple of, a, of uh, adjustments to the face. And so in this particular case, um, I'm going to do exactly what I did before. Um, here, I'm going to go, I'm going to go ahead and merge these layers and make another duplicate layer here. And I, uh, I'm going to go ahead and tell you what my, my favorite filters are. So the first thing I'm going to do here before I show you the filter here is I'm going to go ahead and, and enter quick mask mode again, and I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to, I'm going to select her face again. This time we can use a bigger brush, but this time I'm going to grab her entire face. Now we're all not spring chickens anymore, and I know how you ladies like to, and men, like to present themselves looking as best they can on the internet. <laughs> so everybody likes their skin to look good, and so uh, I'm going to go ahead and do a, a we're going to go ahead and fix up her skin here a little. Again, I'm going to exit the quick mask mode. I'm going to go back to uh, select the inverse. So now I've got her face selected on both sides. I'm going to go to filter. These are my favorite plugins, folks. Um, this is the Nick collection. Um, which I tend to use more when I'm working on landscapes and stuff. Uh, but my three favorite filters um, I, I have purchased through Topaz Labs, and um, that's Topaz Adjust, Topaz Clean, and Topaz Remask. These are my these are my three favorite tools in my toolbox, and I I use them. Boy, I'm going to say probably on just about every photo I use in some way, shape, or form. Um, Topaz Clean is is for things like skin. 
So we're going to bring up the, the, the Topaz Clean plugin. We'll go ahead and zoom in on this. Um, I have used, this is the, this is the skin evening um, uh, feature. And I kind of already have this set at my own thresholds and, and textures and, and all of this. They, they have all these really nice controls where you can sort of mess around um, and sort of get it where you want. I, I tend to over exaggerate whatever I'm doing. Um, this allows me to adjust the opacity of the layer and, and get as much reality back into the photo as possible. I, 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 I want my photos to look, I, I, I don't wanna, I, I, want my, I want the people and the things in my photos to continue to look real. Um, it, it, to me, it shouldn't look like it's been over-processed. So what I'm gonna do though, is I'm gonna, I'm gonna apply these filters and I'm gonna overdo it on the filters and I'll show you why. So in this case, I've, I've, this is overdone, but I'm gonna go ahead and accept this. And now when I look at her face, you can see it now looks very sort of cartoonish and just doesn't look right. And now I'm gonna, what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna adjust the opacity of this, of this layer so that, that that underneath layer that's the original photo shines through. And so what I do here is I, there's a, an opacity control right here. And I drop it down to zero. And then I start applying this, I start applying it. And all I do is I just slide it up the scale as I'm applying this filter and I get it to a point where the person still looks real, but I've got enough of the filter that it, that it looks good. And for me here, I'm kind of hanging around at about 55%. A little more. Now, if I turn off this, uh, this uh, layer underneath it, you can see that this is all of that filter that I'm applying. It's not a lot. But it's, it's, it's smoothed out her skin, and since she's far enough back in the picture, it doesn't look unreal. Carl, can you um, go back in, uh, blow up on her face again, and then toggle off the visibility of the um, top layer, sure. just so people can see w what it's done with and without? Because sure. as you toggle that on and off, yeah. it'll show you exactly that. So that's the original. That's where I've, uh, and all I've done is, you know, on the original, all, all we have done is, is dropped the exposure level to remove the, the blowouts and we've brightened up the, the shadows. And so this is that, that skin evening filter applied at 55% and you can see what it's done. These are the favors that I do for my wife. Does she appreciate it? I don't know. So <laughs> anyway. Uh, at, at this point, uh, I, I'm happy with this. I, I, I think that this looks okay to me. Um, again, uh, I, I can merge layers, uh, but I, I want to show you guys one other thing here. Um, here we go ahead and merge these together and create another duplicate layer. And then in a minute here, we're going to have a lot of layers. Um, I, I want to show you uh, something that I do that allows you to fix both sides of a photo and, and not, have, um, not have retinal rivalries as much as possible. So let's just say, for instance, um, let's say like this, this uh, scar on her forehead here. Let's say I just want to remove this. Um, and I want to remove it on both sides of the photo. Now, in Stereo Photo Maker, you've got the clone tool. Um, which works really well, but boy, you really need to make sure your photos are, are, are sitting at that zero parallax perfectly so that you don't end up with a, a dent or a, or a protrusion um, in somebody's forehead, you know, in this particular case. So um, I, I find it's just as easy to do this stuff in Photoshop. And so in this case, I'm just going to go to the, uh, to the uh, healing brush tool. 
again, I'm going to, I'm going to use a, a soft, I've got my hardness set at 85%. Now I just want to make sure that's going to just cover this, this area right here. So now that I'm happy with that, I just need to borrow from a part of the photo that's, that's going to work. And I just want to make sure that both times that, 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 that when I do this, that I'm going to be borrowing from the exact same place on the other photo. So this just to the left here, this looks okay to me. So I hold down my, um, my alt key and that allows me to target this area and click on it. And then I'm just going to come over here and I'm going to remove that and I'm going to do it on the other side of the photo. And all I want to do is make sure that I'm grabbing from the same exact place on the other side. Same thing, like if I, she's got this little sort of divot here on her cheek, I'm just going to go up to the up and right of it a little bit and blend it in. Same thing here, grab, drop. And I can, I can I just fix, fix a couple of facial imperfections. Now, if you want at this point and you're worried, you pull out your viewer, take a look at your photo and see if anything in it is, is, is flashing at you. You know, like you've created some sort of a, if you've, you've created some sort of a retinal rivalry. And in this particular case, I haven't, it looks good. So, um, I'm going to start heading into other areas of the photo here. And for me, it's okay to just merge this stuff at this point. I still have the original photo saved. And if I want to import it in and, you know, put it as a layer at the bottom, I can do that. The next thing I want to start dealing with is um, the background of this photo. So I'm going to duplicate my layer. Now in this particular case, um, I, I use different filters and one of my favorite filters here is Topaz Adjust. Uh, like I was saying at the beginning, if you use an adjustment layer, it's going to affect the entire photo. Now you could go in and erase the areas that maybe you don't want. Um, but in this particular case, I'm, I'm going to take a, a slightly, maybe a little bit more complicated approach. Um, just so you can see how I handle this. Um, in this case, uh, and I'm, I'm just, I'll should just show you dynamically what, what Topaz Adjust can do. And it has a lot of, uh, it has a lot of interesting filters. And I, I'll just, I'll just run through my filters here. These, these are sort of pre, preset filters in their Vibrant collection. And I'll just sort of run down and I'll look at them and go, and, you know, and I'm, I'm not looking at her, I'm looking at the background. My boy, geez, I like that setting sun, but you know, maybe I'll talk about that later and apply that in some way. But I run through and Spiceify here is one of my favorite filters. If I apply this filter, and I'm gonna remove this filter in just a second. If I add this filter, this, this affects everything in the photo. I mean, you know, her, her skin is no longer smooth. Um, this is not really a high resolution photo, but you can see that it's, it's added these lines back into her face and it, it looks grainy and th th this, is, this is not my intent. So um, I don't want to use this filter. I, I, I want to use the filter but I only want to use the filter on, on the environment around her. So what do I do? We're going to go ahead and undo that topaz layer. And I want to cut her out of the photo. Um, and and I, I could just erase this, like I could apply that entire filter and maybe just erase around her skin, um, which is sort of a quick and dirty way to do it. But uh, I want to show you guys a, another tool, um, and that is the Topaz Remask tool. So in this particular case, I want to just cut her out of the photos and, and deal with the area around her. 
So on this duplicated layer, I'm going to go to filter, topaz, and topaz remask. This is a this is really cool, and I, I'm gonna I'm gonna do this as quick and dirty as possible. Um, you can spend as much time as you want messing around with this particular uh, plugin um, to get it really really super accurate. Um, and this is the point where my uh, speaking to you is gonna get kind of boring because I do need to trace around her on both sides. Anybody has any questions? Now would be a good time to pipe in. Hi, Carl. I have one for you. Um, it's sure. General, though. Are you on a Mac or a PC? I am on a PC. Okay. And it is the only thing about Carl that is PC, I might add. <laughs> <laughs> I'm afraid my I'm afraid my my uh, my uh, my political out views uh, cause Mr. Koontz to have a um, a stereotypical view of me. <laughs> well, at least it's stereotypical and not monotypical. Yes, exactly, exactly. That's a good one. I'll I'll use it later. This really is a fantastic tool. I mean, if, if you guys get your hands on this thing, um, uh, I, this, is a, this is a great tool for compositing. It's a, it's a great tool if you want to um, uh, like uh, cut around trees because you're adding a, like a, a, a sky, like if you're compositing a sky into a, uh, into a picture. Um, this is a fantastic tool. So uh, yeah, this is about as quick and dirty as I can make it here. And what I'm going to do at this point is I'm going to select this. Um, oh, by the way, the, I was using the, the this is uh, this brush I was using is the keep brush. Um, and now I'm just going to use this is their this is a, a the, the flood fill to cut bucket. And what's that that does is it's going to it's it's telling this plugin what areas of the photo I want to remove. Uh, but in this case, that's not what I want to do. I want to remove her. So let me back it up here. I want to remove her from the photo. So I'm going to put the bucket on her over here. And then I'm going to hit compute mask. And as you can see, this is what it is removing of her. The nice thing about this tool is that it, it feathers into whatever it's cutting around. Um, and that, that feathering just allows for a nicer blend. And if, but if you're really going for super pinpoint accuracy, you can really play around in this plugin to get it just right. You can, you can jump between what it's keeping, what it's masking out, what it's cutting. But I, I always, I like to, like to just look at the mask well, personally, but you know, I, I sometimes I'll go ahead and I'll jump into the keep area. And all I'm going to do here is I'm, I'm going to very quickly get this mask as, as, as accurate as, as, it's, as I need it to be. And again, like I said, this photo is never going to be shown on a, on a big movie screen or anything like that. So I, I just wanted, I wanted to get it as, as accurate as, as, uh, as it needs to be for a very small presentation. So by, by selecting this, uh, this, uh, this remove tool, I can go around the edges of the photo. It'll pick up those areas of the photo that are, that it was sort of unsure. And I don't, like I said, again, I don't really care if this feathers out into the photo. 
Well, how accurate would you be with this if this was the real thing? Would you spend a if this was the real thing? This this could end up being a couple of hour process, but you know, but again, um, uh, I, I would probably use a different technique, and probably the technique I would use would be to apply that that topaz filter that I want for the background, apply it to the entire photo and then just go in and with a soft eraser, um, erase the parts of the photo where I don't want that filter applied. Uh, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd actually just grab the, the eraser and erase her face and erase, um, you know, er, er, erase her arms and her hands and, and, and anything else that I think that that, that topaz filter made look a little bit too unreal. You mean you'd er erase them so that the uh, layer beneath, which doesn't have the filter applied, would show through? Exactly. Exactly. Thank you for putting it into English for me. Some of, some of these areas, too. And also, this is a great filter, too, if you're going around hair. As you can see, it's like, it's like saving the, the, like the, the hair sticking off of her head. It's, 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 a, it's a fascinating filter. But uh, I did want to show it to you guys, so you, uh, you know, it's just, it's just another tool in the tool chest. Okay. I'm using these, uh, you know, and this is the keep brush. It'll, it'll kind of get in there and... Dig back into these areas. David tends to find my process uh, fascinating. And, and the thing is, is listen, guys, at the end of the day, the, the way that I do this uh, may not be the way that you do it. Um, I, you know, I, I certainly don't have a, I certainly don't have a, uh, the, the perfect way of doing it, I'm sure. And I'm sure that there's better ways to do these things. These are just the things that I've sort of have discovered on my own over the years that work for me. And at this point, I'm just going to say, okay, I like it. Now, if I turn off my other layers, this is what I'm looking at. And she's been removed from the photo. But I want to apply now, I, I want to apply the, the topaz filter this layer to this layer. But again, I want to be able to, to um, play with the opacity of that layer. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to I'm going to duplicate this layer that I've just created. So now I've got now I've got the four layers here. If I take this off, even these 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 layers these layers are the same. These layers are the same, but I'm only going to apply the topaz filter to to this top layer. So again, I'm going to go back into Topaz Labs. I'm going to go back to Topaz Adjust. And the filter that we were discussing was the, was the Spicify filter. And this is where you can see where it's actually bleeding into her along these edges. But the filter is just hitting the very edges of her in some areas. Now, to me, again, this is not a big deal. Um, it, it's, uh, once the opacity is turned down and everything, it's, it's just sort of going to all nicely blend together. And in this particular case, I think I decided that the filter I liked the best was the Spicify filter. And within this filter, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to mess with a few things. Um, and, and the nice thing here is, is, is I don't need to use a sharpening, any kind of a sharpening tool at this point either, because uh, th this filter does a <laughs> this filter does a plenty of sharpening for you. Um, as you can see, it's brought some back some blues into the sky. Um, you know, the, the green and the trees, the, the red's really popping. Um, I am going to, again, I'm going to make it look a little bit unreal here. And I'm going to pop up my saturation. I want this ultimately, this, this, this is a fall photo. Uh, the sun was setting and I, I want it to still have that vibe that it's, that it's a fall photo and that it's very golden. So um, I've got this applied on here and I'm like, wow, I'm looking at this and I'm just going, wow, that looks beautiful. Um, 
and if, if anybody goes into my uh, into my uh, Flickr stream and just as sort of an interesting side note, uh, I, I think all of us end up sort of developing a style over the years. We don't even realize it. Um, I'm a, a, a great fan of art and painters and artists and all that stuff. And I'm always fascinated when artists have a, have their own style. Um, and it was funny because a couple of years ago, I, I never considered myself as having a style. But uh, a couple of years ago, I sort of stood, sat back and looked at a collage of my work. And I was like, you know what? I, I do have a style to what I do. You know, who knew? <laughs> I didn't notice before. So um, here that layer is applied. Again, if I turn it off, you can see what we've done to it. I mean, look, that's, it's so dramatic. I mean, we've, we've really brought out a lot of detail and color. And uh, I just need to decide whether or not this is a little bit much for me. So um, I'm going to, again, I'm going to drop my opacity on this le level down to zero. And I'm going to slowly start applying it by bumping that opacity back up. I want it to look good, but like I said earlier, um, I, I still like there to be a certain level of realism to my photos. And I'm looking at it and kind of like it there in that 80% zone sort of looks good to me. I'm happy with that. I'm happy with that. Okay, so I'm going to go back down to this layer down here where she is. And I'm looking at her. Oh, wait, wait a minute. One more thing on this layer too is I, I just want to check something really quick. to make sure that I don't have any uh, weird retinal rivalries. I'm, I'm sort of checking out the work of the, uh, I'm checking out the, uh, the work uh, that came out of the, uh, the remask tool. And right now everything looks okay to me. So now I'm looking at her and I'm going, okay, I want this to sort of be a, a fall, sunset sort of picture and I'm looking at her and I'm thinking maybe I'd like to add a little, a little bit of a, a golden glow to her. So now at this point I can go back down to the layer where where she's not been cut out which is down here and I'm going to go to uh, image adjust and I am going to find the um, Here we go, the photo filter, uh, photo filter. And I like this warming filter. And make sure it's you're preserving your luminosity. If you don't, you can see the difference there on her. But what I want to do here is I want to zoom in on her. And I'm going to add this. Uh, I'm going to add this uh, filter, but I still want it to look real. You know, if I punch it up to 100%, she looks like an orange. And I want to apply it. I just want to apply it subtly. Give her just a little bit more color. And I look at this photo and I go, okay, I'm happy with this. Now, we're, we're going to get into to finishing touches here um, to, to just, you know, sort of, sort of bring it all together. Um, and at this point, I'm, I'm, I'm happy with what I've done here. Um, and I, I'm going to apply a warming filter to the entire photo. But before I do that, um, <laughs> It was funny. I mentioned this to uh, to David last night, and uh, he said, "Oh, he goes, oh, I do the same thing." I'm like, "Oh, perfect. All right. At least we're on the same page on a couple of things." So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to merge these layers together, and I'm going to go back up to her face up here. And by applying this this warming filter to her face, um, I have essentially I've turned her teeth yellow. <laughs> These are the kind of things that bug me. I mean, it, it depends on how detailed you want to get into your photos. 
but uh, I have turned her teeth yellow. And since I know I'm going to be applying a, 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 a warm filter to the entire photo, and I don't want it to turn into her teeth just looking completely yellow. And you can do these steps in the process, you know, like whichever ways make sense to you. It, it's really important though that you just get a grasp on layers and, and how they affect the photo and, and, and where they belong in, in, in your stacking order. Um, and that's just something you kind of learn from experience. Um, in this particular case, I'm just going to go ahead and I'm going to go back into quick mask mode. Um, I'm going to grab my brush up here and make it a heck of a lot smaller. That looks good to me. Oops. Oops. For some reason, I exited quick mask mode. I need to be in quick mask mode. And now my computer has decided to run slow for whatever reason. Hmm. I am not sure why Photoshop has decided to get a little clunky on me at this point. Let me see here what happens if I try to, all right. I have her teeth selected. I'm gonna select inverse. So we have her teeth selected. I go up to image. This is how I fix teeth. Uh, everybody has their own ways of doing it. Um, uh, generally what I do is I go to the, um, uh, to the hue and saturation and I just turn the saturation down. Um, I don't want to make her look like, a, like she's a Las Vegas entertainer though. I want it to still look a little natural. Most human beings have, have a little bit of natural yellowness to their teeth. I just kind of get it where I want it. Looks good to me. Stand back, I look at the entire photo again. It's looking good. And I'm, I'm, I'm happy with where this is going. And so now in this case, um, I can go ahead and merge this with my background. Again, this is this destructive editing I do. I mean, I, I'm, I'm putting my stamp on this and I'm going, okay, I like this. I, I, I like where I'm at with this. Um, I don't see myself going back and, and needing to adjust anything too intensely. So it looks good to me. I'm, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to merge these layers. Again, I'm going to create one more layer, and this is just my final, my sort of my finishing touch here. Now, at this point, I'm going to go ahead and just, uh, I, I could use um, this uh, uh, Nick collection, which is really good um, at applying different sorts of filters. Um, I put up a, a photo recently, boy, geez, I, um, I'll, I'll look for it in just a minute. Um, some of the things you can do with the Nick collection are really dynamic. Um, just, you know, turn photos into just something stunning. But in this particular case, since I have a human being in the photo, uh, in the photo I don't want to go over the top. So again, I'm just going to go to adjustments. I'm going to go back to that photo filter. And again, I want this to have that sort of that touch of fall look to it. Sort of that golden sunset that you get. And I'm gonna put it where I like it. I'm kind of liking that 30% right there. Sort of looks nice to me.
Um, at this point, if anything's, you know, it, it, everything comes down to your own personal choice. Your, what do you like? You know, what, what, you know, what do you want to get out of a photo? You know, I, I turn around and I look at this and this is dramatically different than the photo I started with. But at the same time, to me, it still has that, that taste of realism to it. It definitely looks like it's been processed just a little. Um, but it's, it's just sort of to emphasize the beauty of everything that you're looking at. And, and to me, that's why we do 3D. You know, people look at a two-dimensional photo and they, you know, it's like the old days when you'd show people your vacation photos and they just sort of, you know, flip through them and, and oh, that's nice, that's nice, that's nice. But when you hand somebody a 3D photo, it, it invites them to look at every detail in a photo. I mean, seriously, when you hand somebody a, a two-dimensional picture like this, they'll look and they'll go, oh, that's, that's a nice photo. You know, but, but did they notice that tree? You, did they notice the leaves on the tree? Did they notice the clouds in the sky? Did they, I mean, did they notice the bark on the tree? Um, the thing about a 3D photo is that you're inviting people into, the, into every aspect of the photo. Um, and, you know, people will stop on that 3D photo and really examine it, really look at it. And that's why I like to have from, from edge to edge, top to bottom, um, I like to address every area of my photos that I'm going to present to people. Um, and in this case, I'm happy with this. Uh, there's certainly other things that could be done if I wanted to do them, but um, here I sit. So, I. Uh, you know, you can save it, uh, you know, sometimes I'll stop and I'll save these as PSD files, um, especially when I find myself up at two o'clock in the morning looking on a, working out a photo, I can come back to it. Um, almost all of my photos that are, you know, some of like, like my Disney series and stuff like that, I, I have PSD files for all of them. So if I want to go back in and replace the sky or tweak something or fix it, um, I have these PSD files with, you know, some of them 20, 30 layers. Um, that I can go back in and, and play around with. Uh, but in this case, this is a, this is what I would consider a more run-of-the-mill photo. Um, and the reason I, also the reason I use this photo today is it was something that we could edit within a, within a reasonable amount of time. Carl, so, could you lay the original on top and then toggle between the two? So absolutely, just... absolutely. Let me uh, go ahead and grab it. I'm sorry, I'm not sure why my... It's running slow, hit save. Yeah, yeah, my, my, uh, uh, all of a sudden it started running slow here a little bit early. You know what I'm gonna do here? Is I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and flatten this and save it. And uh, close the program, fire it up again real quick here. So let's go to layer, let's flatten, file, save as, I'm gonna save this as a JPEG. And I am just going to close this. Oh, it looks like a. And Carl, uh, while that loads, there were a couple of questions in the chat. Um, sure. To you. And I'll just skip around a little bit because you're in Photoshop right now. Um, uh, Gordon um, had a question. It might be interesting to hear what alterations you would do if you're not using Topaz filter. Um, again, this is learning the 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 um, the tools that are, are are available within Photoshop. Um, anything that comes out of Topaz is something that you can most likely do within Photoshop. Um, I came across Topaz when I first started doing, um, when I first started doing HDR photos. Um, I, I found that uh, Photoshop is not all that good at processing HDR photos. Um, I wasn't liking the results and I was looking at other artists that I admired on Flickr. And I'm going, wow, how did they get those results? 
And so, you know, I spent a lot of time Googling and jumping into forums, and I discovered that uh, the best program for processing HDR photos was, is a program called Photomatix Pro. And Photomatix is what I use for, for processing my HDR photos, for, for merging them together. It's a very dynamic program. It's got a lot of a great adjustment, uh, adjustment tools in it. Um, but then I was seeing other things that, that sort of fascinated me. And that's, and I can't remember where or when I discovered it, but um, uh, some online tutorial maybe, or a discussion with, a, with another artist and them going, wow, have you checked out Topaz and, and, the, and the things that, that, uh, that it can do? Um, it, it really does sort of, you know, it, it, it gives you the opportunity um, to do things a lot faster. Um, but again, you know, I mean, it's, it's like anything else. No one taught me Photoshop. Um, I've never taken a Photoshop course. Um, and, and we tend to live in a world where it's like, oh, I've got a question, I'm, I'm going to Google it. Or, oh, I've got a question, I'm going to go to YouTube. Or, uh, you've got something stuck on your screen and you don't know how to get rid of it. Oh, here, let me go over to, to YouTube and there's a one minute tutorial that shows me how to fix that. Um, that tends to be the world that we live in now. Um, and we don't tend to deep dive into, into the, our programs and everything that they do. And, and I'm an offender. I, I not 100, I mean, there's so much stuff that Photoshop can do that uh, I'm unfamiliar with. Um, that I'm willing to pay attention to other artists and see what they do and go, oh, wow, that's so cool. Uh, I can apply that technique to what I do. Um, so again, without, you know, beating a dead horse, it really is about learning the tools that are already available to you within the program that you're using. Um, I, I went through a phase a couple of years ago where um, I wanted all of my photos to sort of look like they were from the 1940s and were slightly hand tinted. Um, and so I found a program called Pixlr. And Pixlr is a web-based editing program. It's become more dynamic over the years, um, but they have this fantastic set of filters that will achieve that goal. So, you know, to me more than anything, it's, you know, if you want your photos to have a particular flavor to them or a particular style to them, to me, it's all about just sitting down and doing the research. There's a video tutorial for just about everything on the planet. I mean, it's down to some of the most silly and mundane things that you can possibly imagine. Somebody has created a YouTube video or, or, a, or a blog posting to teach you how to do it. Um, and to, to me, that's great. You know, I, I like using the... Uh, the internet for other things uh, uh, than just arguing about politics. So um, believe it or not. Uh, is there another question that I can sort of vaguely answer? Well, you uh, never did the quick comparison of the before after. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So let me, let me go ahead and open these up real quick. Oh, when I open up, this opens up a dialog box here for my uh, for my other filters for the Nick collection. And then let's go file. You saved the picture as a JPEG, but normally you would save it as a PSD. Um, well, oh, no, I mean, if I'm going to be presenting this thing on, you know, Flickr or any other platform, I, I'm going to save it as a JPEG. Uh, I tend to save my photos in multiple different formats. Um, I'll save it as a parallel. I save it as a cross-eyed. Um, I, I, my full size, you know, un. Uh, my full size photo I always save as a parallel view, um, and then if I want to add borders to it in in uh, SPM uh, sizing, uh, stuff that stuff I just drop it into SPM really quick. So like here, let's jump between the before and after. Here's before. Let me see if I can. And here's after. Before, after. Wow, the clouds look beautiful in the after one. Is that nice? Mm -hmm. Carl, if you want to toggle quickly between 
uh, different images. You can use uh, control tilde key, or if you're on a Mac, command tilde. Okay. It'll switch between the tabs. C control what? Tilde or tilde. It depends how you oh. want to pronounce it. Oh, well, there you go. Thanks, Carl. Very nice. So there you go. That, that's, that, that's the first thing I wanted to present. At this point, I will open up SPM just for quick presentation purposes here. And I will go to File, Open Stereo Image. I'm going to go to my folder where I have this saved. Um, I'll touch on just one more brief topic here really quick, and that's uh, image theft. Um, uh, I, I tend to uh, post things uh, on the internet uh, at a size that if uh, somebody wants to steal it, they're not going to get a very good image out of the deal. Um, I, I learned my lesson very quickly when, when Ferio uh, came into place. Uh, somebody was uh, stealing my images off of um, Flickr and uh, posting them as their own. Uh, so I tend to, if I'm going to put it on the internet, I'm going to put it, I'm going to reduce its size uh, so that they're not going to get much out of it. So in this case, but it's still going to look good. Uh, I find that when I'm going to post to Instagram, um, I'm going to reduce the picture so darn small that I am going to go in and I'm going to uh, use the smart sharpening tool uh, in um, Photoshop. And I'm going to reduce the size of the photo and then I'm going to sharpen it a little bit. Um, so that it still looks good when you're scrolling on your phone and looking at it. Um, but in this case, uh, uh, I've, I'm going to add a, I've add a border to it. You know, I can look at it in cross view or uh, in parallel. Uh, if I want to, if I want to uh, resize it, you know, you, you hit R. You can see this is the size of the photo right now. A lot of times when I'm on um, on Flickr, I'll post a, a little bit larger resolution because people can make those full screen on their on their computer. Um, but for for uh, Instagram, uh, you know, usually no more than 500 pixels wide per photo is is kind of kind of my limit. Um, you know, I again, I just uh, I don't like people snagging my stuff. So I appreciate everybody attending today. I hope everybody got something out of this. Um, you know, moving forward, the, the idea here with this program is to uh, have other people like David and, and uh, whoever we can find to jump in, teach some classes every now and then, do what I did here, which is to take you from the beginning all the way to the end. We can talk about things like, uh, you know, uh, everything from composition to uh, compositing to, you know, HDR, you name it, you know, you can always even message us and, and say, hey, you know, here, here's a topic I'd like to, to cover. And then what we would do is take you from the beginning all the way through the end of the process. So you're not just getting a brief overview, but getting more, a more hands-on uh, approach. Um, if you enjoyed this, uh, and I'll, I'll leave it up to you to decide whether or not you enjoyed it. Uh, oh, and by the way, this is this is my wife right here. Uh, I was working on this photo because she created a, a YouTube channel recently. Um, her, her COVID hobby was learning how to play the ukulele, and she's gotten really good at it. So we've uh, we've created a, a, a channel for her on YouTube. Uh, but if you enjoyed the program today uh, and you're not a member of the LA 3D Club, uh, this is not required. But uh, you know, if, if you want to go to the LA 3D Club website and on the donate button. Uh, throw us $5 and put in the memo line that it's for your Saturday, Saturday session. Uh, we'd appreciate it. It, it might uh, get us, uh, maybe if we build up enough funds there, we can maybe pay some, uh, some people that are more professional than me to come in and teach a class. Who knows? So uh, go ahead and uh, do that if, uh, if you feel so inclined. Uh, Carl, uh, I, uh, it. I thought, how about if we go um, uh, in tile mode so we could see everybody and I been sure. jotting down some questions um, that people had and I could just recap them and people could ask a few more if that's okay. Okay, I think you guys put it into tile mode though, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Gallery or gallery mode, I suppose. Right, each participant has to do that on their okay, own. Great. 
All right, awesome. Um, I'll just uh, I'll just start from the beginning. Um, Gordon had a question uh, for you, which was um, the connector you used for your smaller rig. Um, was that a tripod socket to tripod socket? Uh, or are you talking about the, uh, the the G12s? Yes. Okay. Yeah, the, the G12s are, are running mm. on Stereo Data Maker, and they use the standard. I don't know if you can see it here. They use the standard mini USB. And um, I have uh, Franz Van de Kamp, who um, I know through Flickr, he makes uh, cables. And all it is, is it's the two wires with the two, um, with the two uh, mini USB connectors at the end and a, and a trigger button that usually has a small stack of batteries in it. Um, oh, oh, Carl, sorry, sorry to interrupt, but I, I actually meant the, the physical connector there. Is that a bar that you have screwed into the tripod sockets? Oh, oh hey, now you're, <laughs> now you're talking an entirely different workshop. Um, <laughs> yes. Yeah, I, I make my own brackets. Um, and in this case, that's, that's what you're looking here. I've, I've made my own bracket. Um, if I pop one of these off real quick. I know this is an aside a little bit, so no, thank no, you. that's all right. That's all right. Um, I, I made two of them. I, oh, so what I do is I go out and I buy a metal uh, metal aluminum bar, and I, I put it in a vise. Or the first thing I do is I put it in a um, what do they call that? A, I have like a, a miter template, and so I, I'm going to put it in there, and I, I use a saw to just sort of get a, a really straight cut on it, uh, and then I'll. I'll cut in about halfway into the bar and then I'll put it into a, a vise and I'll get it to bend it to 90 degrees. And then once I've bent it to 90 degrees, I don't know if you can see this here. Once I've got it bent to 90 degrees, I fill it with JB Weld, which you can buy at uh, auto you know, parts stores. Yeah, any, any parts store, you know, I'll, uh, or, you know, Lowe's or Home Depot. And I, I, I fill it with JB Weld. And this makes it really freaking strong. Um, I then measure out where I want my my holes, and I you know and I you're you're, you're drilling through metal, so you you are gonna you're gonna ruin a few drill bits. But um, you know I start out with a, a a guide hole, and I punch it, drill it through. Uh, I use a, a quarter inch bit, and then I use a I think it's a I think it's a half inch bit to 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 create a countersunk hole in it. Now in this particular case, I can set these things on a, on a dual mount and I can expand, you know, if, if I want, if I want to go hyper vertical, I can do that. And of course I, I do have, you know, your standard, you know, two on the side and I can go like this and, you know, and, and you can set them out at, at any distance that you want. But uh, yeah, I, I just, I, I created these two to go side by side to hold both cameras, or this itself holds both cameras. But uh, that, that, was, uh, that was necessity being the mother of invention. Um, I had run into what my, one of my first mounted rigs, of course, was, the, was this, uh, this rig here. And I'm trying to remember the name of the guy that created the Lank Shepherd Pro. His, his name is escaping my mind at the moment. But he had created like a, a milled um, aluminum mount to, to put the cameras on. Um, but at the point I discovered 3D, um, he wasn't making them anymore. So I had to come up with my own. Um, and this was sort of my first attempt at, at making a mount. Um, and I've, I've made a few more over the years, but um, yeah, I just make them by hand. Awesome. Well, thanks for sharing. You're welcome. And they're not that hard to make. They're just, uh, you know, just having the right tools in your garage and, and just taking the time to get it right. We also have a comment and a question. Um, mm -hmm. Andrew uh, commented that Topaz can function as a standalone program. And that is true. Plugins. That is and, true. And, oh, awesome. And then Marty asked um, that he still has CS4. Uh, does Topaz work with CS4? Absolutely. It does. It does. Great. There are different versions, though. I mean, uh, 
the latest version will not work on CS4, for example. Right. Well, uh, uh, well, maybe. I mean, you know, I'm I'm not gonna I'm not gonna give anybody any advice about <laughs> where to go looking for these things if you need an older version. I'll I'll, I'll leave that up to your own creativity. Lee Pratt made an interesting comment, um, mm -hmm. just in case people haven't been reading them all along. Um, he mentioned that the older Topaz plugins are better than the new ones, um, and that the, the letters AI at the end refers that they're more automated. Um, yeah, you know, I have, um, I have as standalone programs, I have, uh, I have Topaz, um, I want to say Sharpen, and I have Topaz Glow. Um, those are standalone programs, and the Topaz Sharpen, and they're both AI programs. Um, boy, I open up that sh uh, Sharpen program, and it just, I mean, it just destroys my computer. It's, uh, um, I think I, I, my computer has like, I'm, I'm going to say like maybe, I, I don't think my computer has more than four or eight gigabyte of RAM. I can't remember, but boy, I mean, you really have to have a modern, very fast computer with a lot of RAM to, to run those AI, AI programs. Um, but boy, I, I open them up and they, they bog my computer down and, in, uh, in, in bad ways. And then I, then I have to, uh, you know, I have to ask myself, you know, how badly I, I need that particular feature. Um, and I, I tend to just kind of drift right back into Photoshop because that's the area that I'm, I'm comfortable with. We uh, had a, a tip that um, got some very positive reaction um, in Photoshop, and I thought it was really good when you're doing your demo that you actually show where you're going to use menus and to adjust the brush size. Um, mm -hmm. But others also use the bracket keys on the keyboard to and, and make the brush larger or smaller. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, that was kind of like floating around a little bit, and um, I'm sure people are using that or will start to use that. Yeah, now I don't know, to say, you know, for the people that are suggesting that though, but you can't adjust the hardness of your, of your brush. Actually, you, like. you can, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't remember what the shortcut is for that. I just like opening up the menus, but yeah, I mean, hotkeys are always good to, to know. It's um, something like uh, alt, uh, alt bracket or option bracket, uh, but I, I don't remember for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I don't spend I don't spend a lot of time on the keyboard um, when I'm working in Photoshop. A, a lot of it's just done with the mouse. I use so many keyboard shortcuts that I I actually uh, had to retrain myself to use to purposely use two two hands because I'm forever doing this motion right, right. Uh, with when I'm working on a project because I can go through you know steps so much faster because I know a zillion. Uh, Photoshop shortcuts and when I started getting if I do that a lot I start getting pains through the section of my hand obviously that's a bad thing so yeah. when that when it starts hurting I always got to remember back off the keyboard shortcuts and start using menus more etc cetera, etc cetera. right right yeah. I, 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 I can keyboard shortcuts you all day long in, in Excel but um, <laughs> Photoshop, <laughs> not so, Photoshop not so much but uh, yeah, no, and I appreciate that. That's uh, that's it's always good to know your programs best you can. Um, you know, and I certainly, man, I to this day, I, I mean, I've been using Photoshop for, geez, I'm gonna go back and. Well, I was using it well before I started shooting in 3D. That's for sure. So it's something I've kind of played around with forever. But I, I found it interesting because I, I, I go back to my old archives and my first 3D camera was um, back when the digital com com commercial digital cameras first came out and I bought a little Canon, um, I think it was like a, it was like a P200 or something. It was a, a massive two megapixel picture. Um, and I remember going to, to Fry's out there in California and I, I, th I think my wife and I, it was our, our first camera after we got married and we spent 
you know, three or four hundred dollars on this little two megapixel camera. And, you know, at, at some point that thing got thrown in a drawer or whatever. And um, years later, when I first was introduced to 3D through owning a stereoscope and decided that it would be cheaper to make my own 3D photos and my, my wife was pregnant and I'm going, wow, this would be a great way to document my family. And that, that was really my original intent with 3D. As I turned my attention back to that little two megapixel camera and I thought, well, geez, I bet I can pick one of these things up on eBay for 20 bucks. And sure enough, I got onto eBay and I picked one up for 20 bucks. And um, I, I got a little block of wood and I, uh, I had two little blocks of wood and I glued them together and I countersunk a couple of holes through them and I, I screwed the cameras together and I didn't know what I was doing. Um, I went out and I was finger syncing, but when I'd finger sync it, I'd push the, if I pushed them at the same time, I, it'd cause a little bit of a, so one of the pictures would be perfectly in focus and the other one would be a little bit blurry. So I started playing around in the menus and I'm like, wait a minute, I can get a two second timer on this thing. You know, so then I said, I'd set them both for a two second timer and then I'd, then I'd hit them and that would allow me to stabilize the cameras there for a second. And, and I ran around finger syncing cameras for, you know, uh, well, two, three years before I was like, you know, I started getting really upset at the photos I was losing um, because of uh, motion in the background or, uh, or, or weird distortions from trying to finger sync. So uh, that's when I was like, man, I, I've got to figure out a way to synchronize a couple of cameras. And, you know, I, I, I don't go as far back as the, as, as film in 3D, but, you know, certainly digital. So uh, it, ever since then, it's been a, uh, aside from budgetary constraints, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. trying to figure out a way to synchronize a couple of cameras in, in, in an affordable fashion. Um, this, uh, I, I remember this, this uh, Sony DSCV3 setup was not affordable. I, this, this whole rig cost me well over a thousand dollars to put together. But, um, <laughs> you know, at, at the end of the day, it's, it's just uh, getting what works for you. Um, I find that it's so important to really learn your cameras inside out, all of the little things that they can do. Um, it, it's just really, really important. Um, and, and I, you know, I, I squeeze as much out of my cameras that I possibly can. <laughs> Thank you, Carl. This uh, last topic is, I'm gonna put it into three parts. Um, it's a question it's an answer that someone responded to, and then I'm gonna put out a challenge. Okay. So the question was from Marty, um, which is to make adjustments on both sides of the screen um, of your images, um, is there a way to link them together? And a response was, is no, that, that there is not. So we were curious if you know of any, um, and then I'd also throw out the challenge that maybe we can find um, a way to do that um, yeah. I saw that in Photoshop 2018-19, um, they have a symmetry tool, but it's not getting what we want. It's more like a mirroring effect. But I do have some ideas on maybe a workflow to, to harness what you do for one for the other. Um, but uh, Carl, do you have any ideas for that? I know that, uh, and I see David smiling over there <laughs> because... I saw him do something in a workshop recently where yes, he was linking the layers together. Um, so he might be able to teach something like, but I, th I think you're actually talking like when you're doing corrections to one side of the photo and, and doing those corrections to the other side of the photo at the same time. Um, the, the problem is gonna be one of where it is in the photo. You, you gotta remember when you're doing a right and a left photo that, you know, my nose is not going to be in the same place on the right as it is on the left in the same geographic location. And so th that's why if you're using the cloning tool in, um, uh, in the closest, uh, the closest thing that comes to my mind is using the cloning tool um, in uh, stereo photo maker is that you really need to get whatever part of the photo you're going to, where you're going to say, in, in, that, in that case, you're more sharing from one side of the photo to the other. So you're not really cr correcting both sides of the photo. You're just, you, you've got something wrong with one side of the photo. And so you want to grab it from the other photo and, and, and duplicate it onto the other one. 
And you really have to get those photos at zero parallax. You have to adjust them to zero parallax at the point of correction, at the point that you want to correct. It's got to be at zero parallax for you to sh uh, share from one side of the photo to the other. Um, it, it's, it's an interesting concept um, and certainly worthy of pursuing. Um, and it, it's, I'm, I don't know. I, I, I honestly, I, I got to throw it out and say that I don't know if something like that is available or possible within Photoshop. I don't know well, of any automated approach, but uh, here's what I do. I, uh, Carl, I don't work like you do. I, I, I work as non-destructively as I can. Right. And I use adjustment layers anytime I do a, um, a retouch, like for example, on your wife's uh, face and so forth. I will do that on a new layer. Everything is separate. Mm -hmm. And here's what I do. I uh, while while viewing the thing, while viewing the image uh, cross eye view, uh, or you know whatever view works for you, mm -hmm. um, I I select I select each of the layers or all of the layers um, that I've made the uh, adjustments to adjustments and retouches on one image. I will then duplicate all those layers over to the other image, mm -hmm. and and then I do exactly what you said. I I I have to, uh, I have to uh, use the move tool and start right. using the, the arrow keys to shift it, you know, laterally, until uh, and, and, I, and I and I view it in stereo while I'm doing this until I've got it exactly dead on. Mm -hmm. That is a quick way of, right. of 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 matching what you're what you're doing on one image to the other image. Yes, and 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 I have done that before, and it's interesting that you mentioned that. Because when I was processing this particular photo, uh, the first time, um, I did end up with a, um, a retinal rivalry on her forehead. And so I literally just, I grabbed that part of her forehead, um, again, with a soft selection tool. And I copied it and pasted it over onto the other side. So, you know, copied it, pasted it, and slid it over there and, and looked at it in 3D and laid it exactly where it belongs. It's good to have like a good anchor point. So like whether it's uh, like, I think I used on that photo and if, if I can share my screen again. Let me go back to Photoshop here. I believe when I did it on this photo, or maybe it wasn't this one. But what I'll do is I'll look for something that's really prominent or really that stands out. Actually, let me go back to the before photo. I'll, uh, there, there's just a section of her forehead that I copied over and I believe, like see this spot right here? I'll pick up some sort of a geographical spot that I will include in the copy. So that like if I'm gonna, and I'll just use the, the lasso tool here with a four pixel feather. If I, let's say I just wanted to copy this portion of her forehead, I would go ahead and I would grab that and make sure that that's part of it. So if I hit control C and control V and I've now pasted it and I've got this, this area here, you can see that that, that little geographical location is still there. So if I move it over to the other side of the photo, and, and it's it's sometimes it depends on the, the the it depends on how big it depends on how big something is. You know, I, it, it, the smaller the smaller the thing that you're copying, the more forgiving it's going to be. Um, it, it's when you start messing around with big things um, that uh, you can start ending up with. Uh, retinal rivalries or the, the 3D will look distorted. That area of the photo will look flat um, because you've copied it over. Um, but in this case, she's far enough back in the photo that I'm not gonna really worry about it. But now you can see that same geographical location is there. So in this case, I can just grab it and I can drop it in the same place and then just turn it off and on just to make sure that I'm dropping it correctly.
or even mess with the opacity to see if it's if it's in the right spot. So, yeah, I I, I think uh, I think you and I are talking the same language there. Carl, I do the same thing. Although I uh, I um, if I if like for example, well, like I'll 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 pick a particular part of the image to um, as kind of a visual anchor point. And if I don't see anything that's obvious, I'll actually create a new layer and draw a, uh, a dot or a, or a rectangle or what have you right. as my guide. And, and then when, I'm, when I've got them uh, situated exactly right, I'll delete those, those uh, layers. And here's another thing I, I should have mentioned. A, uh, another difference in my technique versus yours is I, I never work on attached uh, you might want to unshare your screen, by the way. Um, I, I, I don't work on attached pairs. I always work on a left and a right separate images that way. And, and what, I, what I do is when I say I duplicate the layers, I actually select the layers, right click them, select duplicate layer, and then assign it to the other image. Right. That way it's already... Um, horizontally aligned and it's mm -hmm. already in the ballpark as far as lateral movement you just have to fine tune it and by the way here's a here's a caveat to uh to that technique to to duplicating uh adjustments and adjustment layers and uh retouching layers to another image if if you're talking about something that's i mean if it if it's straight on, great. If it's not straight on, like if it's somebody's face and they're looking at, you know, straight at the camera or whatever, fine. But if if it's a close-up, say, and one, one uh, lens is picking up, you know, this, the other lens is picking up that, or that that's an exaggeration, but you know what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Because of that uh, parallax, sometimes the adjustments or the retouches won't quite line up. But uh, one thing you could do with that is you could you could. Uh, I, I use my free free transform tool quite a bit. That's what I was just going to say. That's what I, I do exactly the same thing. Although I'll I'll generally turn it into a smart object uh, so to uh, keep it lossless. But I'll sure. I'll uh, but yeah, I do the same thing. I'm basically distorting it or warping it so that it uh, mm -hmm. so that it matches correctly. And again, viewing in stereo while I'm doing this trick to make sure I'm not creating a monster. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I employ those techniques too. It depends on the photo I'm working on. Um, like I was saying at the beginning, um, I, I tend to use separate left and right images, um, especially if I think it's going to be, uh, again, you know, LA 3D Club, we project up on that big screen up there. And and I I'd really just, you know, I'd, I'd work on separate photos and I'd put them side by side on my screen. Um, in this particular case, it's a it's just a judgment call. Um, you know, to go ahead and use the, the, the attached images um, because I, I'm thinking of how it's going to be used um, in, in that particular case. Ah, just, just use it as a single photo. But um, again, we're, uh, th these are things that we can have future workshops about. Like, I mean, if you really want to get down into those, to those little nitty gritty details, or if you've got a photo that like you're going, hey man, I, this would be a great learning tool for stereographers. Um, and, and how to correct, you know, something that's that small or, or, or that specific. Hey, Rob, uh, pr propose teaching a class for us, <laughs> you know, you know uh, I nearly... or, or, or whatever. I'm just like, seriously, because there is so much to learn. There's, there's so many uh, neat different techniques and tools that, that everybody uses a little bit differently. And uh, boy, I'm, I'll be at the front of the line sitting and, and waiting to learn. You know, I nearly prefaced uh, what when I started mentioning that I nearly prefaced it with uh, I should probably do a, a workshop sometime because I Absolutely. I have done where I have done workshops at uh, NSA conventions, but but uh, yeah, I'd be glad to do one for uh, LA 3D. Yeah, and I, since this was the first session, I, I just I wanted to be able to to do this within an hour, so um, I, I I selected a photo that I could go okay, man, within an hour I can take you uh, beginning to end and and show you a finished product. Um, there are certainly photos that, you know, I mean, I'll spend four or five hours on them. 
Um, and uh, I, I can show you the finished project and show you how, how beautiful it came out. But um, sitting and watching me actually go through something like that is a bit like pulling teeth. Yeah, of course. <laughs> so, um, I, I think if, like, if you can come up with an example of something that you can uh, present within an hour that, that like, you think people can really like, sink their teeth into and really learn something from it, um, that, they, that they can uh, apply it in a, in a practical way to their, to their photo editing, by all means, please feel free to share. Most of my, te actually all of my te techniques involve uh, trying to work around, or succeeding actually, I should say, in working around Photoshop's 2D limitations because what I've said at the beginning of every one of my workshops is uh, Photoshop is not a 3D photo editing app and it almost certainly never will be. So all of, virtually all of my techniques are are kind of clever ways to work around that limitation. Well, and just as a side note for everybody, the reason I use a Photoshop CS6 is because I think it's the last version um, that, that you could have without paying uh, uh, Adobe a, a subscription fee. Um, and what can I say? I'm a, cheap, I'm a cheap bastard, so. I'm right there <laughs> with you. I'm right there with right you, there. Carl. Yeah. And in fact, I did a, uh, in one of the workshops I did at, uh, at 3 dcon I, I, uh, I, I, of course, I always mention, okay, I'm using a Mac. It doesn't matter. All these techniques will work on Windows. And I'll tell you the corresponding keyboard shortcuts. And I always tell them I'm using CS6. And I tell them what versions, forward or backward, you know, uh, my techniques will work on. They always work forward, not necessarily all the way backward. Right. And um, and at one of them, I meant when I mentioned uh, I'm using um, CS6 because I am no fan of Adobe's subscription model. There were probably 100 or 200 people in the room, and it, it, they just erupted in applause. <laughs> we are not alone. There are a whole lot of people who just frigging hate that yeah. subscription model. So I'm still using CS6 as well, but at some point mm -hmm. I'm going to have to, uh, I'm going to have to start uh, paying them constantly because there are some new, there are, there, there are new, I mean, as somebody pointed out in the chat, CS6 is, CS6 is circa 2012 and there are, there are new tools, new abilities in, in creative cloud that I'd really like to be able to use, so. Right, no, I, I, I agree with you entirely. Oh, yeah, I, I think I can show this to everybody really quick. Um, the, that other set of tools that I have, um, which are the, uh, which is this Nick collection. Um, here, I thought I'd show you guys this really quick. Oh, I see what's going on here. Uh, I, I do occasionally shoot 2D. Um, driving her down a road and I came across this scene and I shot this with my uh, cell phone. And I took this, uh, took this thing home and I, I used the Nick collection and this is the final product. So, yeah, I'm a, I'm a big fan of photo processing, it, it, you know, it, you know, but to turn, to turn that into that, I don't know. That's, that's great work, Carl. That looks great. I just, I just like to make my photos look pretty if I'm going to show them to people. <laughs> so, at any rate, I, I thank everybody for attending today. Um, that, that was you, fun. Uh, what's that? Thank you for uh, doing it and for uh, kicking off this program with a bang. Oh, you're, you are most welcome. The, the, the whole point today was just to try to teach everybody to how to squeeze as much as they can out of their photos. Uh, David and I will get together and uh, we'll plan some more moving forward. We're certainly not going to do it every Saturday. Um, but, uh, you know, time and availability and, and good topics and uh, what we think people can, uh, can, can share in a practical way. So thank you, guys. All right. And we'll see you all in 20 minutes on the New York meeting, right? <laughs> <laughs> Go get your coffee. <laughs> right. Bathroom break time.
Thank you all. Goodbye.